Yeah, hello everybody. <laughs> so, um, I'm the last thing uh, standing between you and lunch, I know, um, and these colleagues as well, I guess. So we'll try to speed through that and uh, give you your, your lunch. Um, so the talk that uh, we want to uh, give today is about the lab as a service concept. So um, I guess you've heard a lot about the I-14Y in general and what is good for and certification and all those things. Uh, we wanted to uh, talk a bit about um, what the underlying thing really is. So what is this lab as a service thing and um, how did it come together? Um, I guess the, the first thing to get started is really like um, asking what it is and um, why it has been developed. Because there's already a lot of labs out there, so why would we need another thing? Um, the biggest difference, I guess, between um, what we've been doing and what other labs in general, like if you look at labs at uh, telcos or university or whatever, um, is that it's a joint effort. Right? So there's multiple companies here, we're 11 partners in this project, and all of them have a certain interest in um, how should the lab be run, what should be possible to do within the lab. So that's something very important that had a big influence on how we designed this whole thing. And another important part um, is we, being financed by the government in the end, um, wanted to base this whole thing on open source software. So we did not just throw a lot of money at a lot of vendor solutions to solve this problem of how to run infrastructure, but we looked at a lot of different options of how can we provide certain pieces of the infrastructure of testing equipment and all of those things as a service and bring together this lab as a service concept. Um, the talk is basically divided into three pieces. Um, the first part uh, will be about the lab automation itself, and I'll be talking about that in just a minute. The second part um, is really focused towards lifecycle management because we didn't just build the lab to run it once and then wreck it down, but we actually built it to run it for a while, so lifecycle management, I guess, is something very important. And then last but not least, and probably the most important part in the end is the purpose of this whole thing, right? We want to run tests on top of that. We don't want to just provide a lab and then everybody can go play, but it's actually something where we want to offer the opportunity to test things on top, and uh, Carson will be talking about this. So let's get started with lab automation. Um, automation in general is something where a lot of things, especially in the marketing you see, uh, makes doing all the things so much faster, right? We're doing automation because we want to speed up, we want to be faster. What is not marketed generally is the part that if you automate a lot of things, it also becomes a lot easier to break all the things. Um, so, solving this problem is something that was very important during the design of this whole lab thing. Because um, you build automation to run a lab with very low amount of personnel in it, um, but at the same time, you cannot expect all of your personnel to be um, the like fail or the, the, the humans that do not ever make any mistakes. That's, that's not happening, right? So we need to somehow emphasize the doing all the right things faster, but steer against the part that would allow us to break everything at once. And the solution that we try to uh, implement here, and this is really not something that we invented, it's just like something that has been used widely by hyperscalers and by all the people that build data centers and labs out there, and that's really configuration as code. So what does configuration as code mean? It means that um, you try to develop and treat your configuration the same way that you would treat code for a software project. Um, I don't think that sounds too unfamiliar for most people here. I think most people in the room should have heard about things like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, all of these things from the past, right? So that was like config management tools. But configuration as code extends it a bit because the idea here is that uh, we're not only using config management tools, but we're also handling these, this code that we wrote in a specific way to allow us, for example, to work with multiple parties on it. So one big advantage here is 
if we handle our configuration as code, we can apply the same principles that we would apply for software development so we can review with multiple parties. We can just share this configuration between multiple parties and multiple parties can look at like how should the state of the lab be configured. And that's not only true for how our web server is configured, but also like how is the benchmarking equipment configured? How are all of those different pieces coming together, right? Another thing pretty important here, if you have configuration as code, you can test it. Obviously, everybody knows you can test software, right? Like before every release, you test the software. Configuration as code, same idea. You can test your software before, you can test your configuration before you apply it. And the last part, also pretty important, but usually an afterthought is, you need to be able to recover, right? So even though multiple people review, there might still be the issue that something breaks at some point. So it would be good if you can roll forward and back. And again, with code and with different releases of this code, you're able to go forward. But if something breaks, you're also able to go backward. I specifically didn't include any code pieces here because I don't think showing code is the, is the right thing here. If you're really interested in how we build all of these things and what different um, tools we used, come talk to me. Um, but I think... Um, Another important thing that we want to talk about now, and that's something that Olaf will talk about, is um, how we're using this in the lifecycle management of the lab. Thanks, Jan. So, clicking one. Okay, good. So, I think this is the most boring part of the lab of as a service, since it's dealing with processes and lifecycle management, and all of you are aware that this is not, let's say, the funny thing of life. Nevertheless, we have to care about that, and um, the idea is to offer our lab infrastructure to our customers and to the ecosystem. And that's why we have to, let's say, prepare our capabilities and um, have a life cycle management in the process around it in order that you folks can use it if you come to the lab. So we have created a couple of, of uh, nice um, yeah, processes and life cycle management chains you see here on the screen. It's reaching from customer self-service. You can subscribe yourself at the web page. There's a user uh, lifecycle management. There's a project lifecycle management. Project means more or less test lifecycle management. We provide remote and physical access and support as well in shipment, installation. And of course, we have our own tools and systems regarding incident management. And we provide also support to, to you folks. And nevertheless, we have as a resource and resource reservation, uh, uh, resource reservation system, which interacts with the test automation. Carsten will speak about the test automation part later on. So uh, in principle, uh, uh, an approach, if you come with a project or a test to us, will look like that. You contact register with us. Uh, using the self service and getting the support from us, since there is a pro project planning phase. Uh, where we discuss your proposal, your project proposal, what is needed in order to realize that. Then there will be the real project preparation, where we assign resources to your project, and then the pre-staging will happen, So, which mean, includes more or less all the processes and, and uh, process chains regarding uh, accessing the lab remotely or physically, and shipment of equipment, installation, and also, of course, um, supervision of your equipment if you want to put it into incident management. That's the pre-staging, and then, of course, the project execution. Custom will focus on that with the test automation, more or less. And after the project, of course, the closing, we care about shipping back the stuff and all these kinds of activities you have to provide in such a lab as a service context. That's a draft um, life cycle. And with that, I hand over to Carsten to take the test automation. Thank you very much, Olaf. I think uh, it may sound boring, but it should not be underestimated. In the early days of the i 14 lab, we spent or wasted 50% of the project time with just getting the life cycle up and running, and I'm really happy that it's now much more aligned and faster. Because that's part of the story, right? You need to lower the barriers for participation for the vendor ecosystem. You need to speed up everything, and that includes the life cycle management and also the test automation. 
And you know, sometimes when I go to Mobile World Congress, I see vendors saying, yeah, we have test automation. That means basically you, they automate their tools operation. But I think test automation in the context of lab as a service is so much more. It includes the planning, the execution itself, and the reporting. And just the reporting is so important when it comes to certification and reproducible testing. We learned in this you know, much mentioned today, uh, first certifications at the i 14 lab just creating the report, which is a tedious work, took a month at least uh, just to collect all the screenshots, make sure the right results are in. So, so for me, the test automation includes all of these three stages. Let me just develop them really quickly, so starting with the test planning. On the planning side, we need to document the system under test configuration. We need to make sure that uh, the automated test cases are uh, executed in the, right, in the right environment with the right setup. And here you can see a couple of screenshots from the ENTC test automation, which is our contribution to the i14y project. Um, so the test bed needs to be set up. Uh, it needs that the test areas need to be configured and selected. Uh, somehow all of this needs to be documented which test cases are going to be executed in terms of interoperability, in terms of scalability, benchmarking, management and security. And then the expected results also need to be uh, defined because it's important to understand like what I'm actually aiming for. So for example, in the most simple test case, you register a UE, you make sure it, you, uh, it can register to the network. network. It's unclear, is the registration itself enough or do you need to have the data plane established and working? Are you expecting performance from the radio? So these are important questions and the Orion Alliance typically defines for its test cases the expected results but not the pass-fail criteria. So if you forget to define that in lab as a service, then maybe the vendor thinks the radio is doing great if it can get 30 megabit throughput but the operator thinks it's only working great if it can get a gigabit throughput. So this is important stuff and it's important to define it and to automate it so that the test case is repeated over and over again until it passes with the same criteria. Uh, and that's what we've all formalized in our test automation and we've deliberately chosen to use open source as a basis as Jan has mentioned and uh, to implement our own automation which is multi-tool ready. It's not a single vendor's uh, tool. We can plug in different southbound uh, test tools and other kinds of environments. The next stage is the execution itself and typically what we face is vendors fail tests, which is just normal in testing, otherwise it would be useless, then they want to rerun it all the time, over and over again, and that really wears out people if it's a manual environment. The vendor calls or sends emails, and says, oh, can we run the same test tomorrow again? Okay, then you run it, you send the report again and you know, it fails again and so on. So it's important to get this DevOps cycle automated in a way that the vendor or whoever is the, the subject to fix problems can run the tests themselves and can understand what the root cause is by getting access to all of the, um, all of the results without having to interfere with the detailed testbed setup and the, the test tools. Just learning the TM500 graphical user interface takes months. Yeah, sorry Chris, but it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so this, this automated uh, tool configuration and tool selection and the automatic execution in ideal case needs to be shielded from the test tool. Of course, sometimes when you know, Ajesh and Monica test in the lab, uh, then they want to access the real thing, of course, that's, that's normal. But for the regular case of certification, it should be shielded. And here again, you can see some screenshots from how we are shielding this configuration of the, of the tools so that it's all in, in one pane of glass and uh, one window, uh, one, one user interface that's more easy to understand. Of course, there's much behind the automation. I can't go into details here, but at least that's the case for the execution. And finally, the automated reporting. So many mistakes are, are being made in reporting. I'm uh, fortunate to be a member of the TIP Test and Verification Committee. I've seen quite a few lab reports for, for Orion and other technologies. And today, most labs create reports manually. They are a collection of screenshots, sometimes or often actually with, with handwritten cycles in red around, like this is the important point. But then the question is always, well, if something goes wrong and they rerun the test, do they update the documentation? Does it still fit the intro section where the, where the setup was uh, defined and so on? So the automated reporting gets rid of these problems and it just creates everything in an automated way. 
And uh, that's here. These are all screenshots from the automated reporting. Um, and this is also helpful for the troubleshooting support because only if you send the vendor enough information that they believe the results were created with the correct setup and in the correct way, only then they will start fixing the problems. Typically the vendors, no, no um, offense, but typically the vendors will naturally say, well, you ran the test in the correct, in incorrect way or you used the wrong test plan. So you need to overcome that. And the automated reporting, which can be very extensive with all of the details without creating additional work for the lab, uh, this actually is the key to the success of getting things fixed. Because by all means, certification is great, but only it will only pass in the end. There's a ton of work uh, before, a ton of work fixing problems and improving implementations. And many vendors come to the certification which have not run everything in their home environment in their own labs before. So it's important to understand what needs to be improved. So with that, I think these are the three steps that are needed for test automation. At the I-14Y lab, uh, we currently have, uh, we are in the process of automating all of these environments. Somehow the, the fonts are a little bit, I oh, know they're okay, right. So we, we have four setups here. I don't want to go into details, but on the top left, the end-to-end -end automated testing, which is our bread and butter. In the bottom left, the ORU conformance testing, um, which a previous panel talked about. And in the top right, we are currently developing and evolving the uh, RIC and XAP RIP uh, test environment. So far, the use cases are very individual, so we're not, we haven't automated them yet, but we're in the, pl in the process. And in the bottom right, OCloud testing, that's Jan's specialty area. So that said, um, summarizing auto test automation and the whole lab as a service requires test automation, lab automation, automated provisioning, lifecycle management automated. All of these are building blocks to really um, ensure consistent and repeatable testing. And not only that, but also to lower the barrier of participation, to make it faster for the vendors to get a result and to make it in the end cheaper to get a result because it doesn't take person years uh, to run through a test. So with that, uh, I think it's uh, the end of the session and time for lunch. Just before you go there, um, Jan has a demo of the BISDN part of the automation in the marketplace. And uh, from ENTC side, we are running demos uh, in the guided tours next door. Our office is just next building. So um, please, if you're interested, uh, feel free to get more information. With that, thank you very much and enjoy lunch. <laughs>